Most people believe the Holy Spirit exists. But why don't we ever talk about it? We hear about the Holy Spirit and we sing about the Holy Spirit, but do we understand who He is? The Holy Spirit is not meant to be a mystery. He is a person and not an it. The Holy Spirit isn't just a power source to tap into when we need it. It's about communion with the person. There are many aspects of the Holy Spirit. There's a baptism with the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit. And the truth of who He is is painted throughout the Bible. The Holy Spirit is meant to be a part of our everyday lives. And we are called to live in the supernatural. Well, speaking about the, the goodness of God and being filled with uh, uh, the Lord's grace, this young lady right here is going to read the word of the Lord to us out of 1 Corinthians. And I need you guys to all stand with me as we read our verse uh, for our Yet For Us series. Hi, my name is Mia Young Klaus, and I love Jesus. Woo! <laughs> 1 Corinthians 8, 5 through 6 says, For even if they are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. This is what I believe and what I stand on by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on. Perfect. I love it. You can be seated. I love that new part's going to be happening on Sundays. This is what I believe and what I stand on by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? Throughout Scripture, you see men and women that the Spirit of God comes upon to declare the truth of God. So when we see someone declaring truth boldly or making a stand for Jesus or being clear in their hearts, they're doing it not just by the truth of God's Word, but by the anointed Word of God by the Holy Spirit. And uh, Mia is one of those incredible dear saints. So you have a Bible. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to jump right in. We are talking about the power and person of the Holy Spirit today. And our friends in Corinth, as you turn to 1 Corinthians 12, just want to remind you uh, that, that Corinth was an incredibly worldly city. These guys have all the same gods that we're working through. Money, sex, and power were the kind of their three gods worshipped in different ways along, uh, along their journey. And then they came to Jesus. They found a Savior. They found one to fill their soul and fill their hearts. And so Paul is writing this letter to the, to the Corinthian church trying to help them now walk out this newfound faith. But in the middle of it, because of all the idols around them and the old stuff in their life, they find themselves struggling with division and struggling with immorality and struggling with all kinds of inordinate affections and passions, and they sound just like us. If I was to say, what is the United States of America? We are Corinth, but God is calling us out of Corinth and into his plan for our lives. So let's jump into 1 Corinthians 12. It says this, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, that's always brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be unaware. Another version says ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware about the spiritual gifts. You know that when you were pagans, when you were led astray to mute idols, and that's, that's key right there, when you were led astray to mute idols, when you were worshiping gods, the gods to money, the gods to power, when you were worshiping these gods, they don't speak back. But now you worship a God who speaks, not a God that you uh, have, to, have to fall down to that doesn't respond and doesn't have a relationship with you. However you were led, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God, capital S, the Holy Spirit, says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So here we go. 
the Corinthians are needing to know about the Holy Spirit. We've already had some hints in 1 Corinthians 2. We've had some hints along the way of the Holy Spirit's work. We've, we've had some hints along the way that our life is to be controlled by the Spirit. Our life's no longer our own. Don't you know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? We've had these admonitions leading up to chapter 12. And we're going to be taking nine weeks to unpack 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. We're going to go through the spiritual gifts in depth. But before we go into the all the nuances of how does the how do the spiritual gifts work? How do we move in the life and the power of God? We have to back up and talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to back up to go forward uh, today as we again clarify and clean up around this idea of who is the Holy Spirit. So let me just jump right in there and say this: the, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one God in three persons. So we have one God, God the Father, Jesus Christ, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are one God expressed in three different ways. So the Holy Spirit is not the junior partner of God. He's not in it. He's not the other. He is God. (laughs) Fully and completely God. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we are talking about God himself. Genesis 1 picks us up when in creation, says Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image. So God, the one God, three persons, says, let us make man in our, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, image according to our likeness. We have another uh, clarifying um, word from the scriptures about uh, the Holy Spirit being God. It's in Acts chapter 5, one of the more concerning scriptures to read in the New Testament. Uh, These guys are lying about what they're doing with their money. They're telling the apostles that, hey, we, we, we're doing, we're, we're, we did this, we did that. But they lied to the, to, to the leaders. And here's what it says in Acts 5, verse 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, this is interesting. You're not just lying to a person. When you're saying, hey, I did this godly thing, but you didn't do it, you're lying to God. That kind of brings the accountability up a little bit. And why did you lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain in your own? They said that they had bought it for a certain price or distributed a certain price. And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. Once again, reaffirming that the Holy Spirit is God. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit... And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, again, if your mind cannot contain God being one in three expressions, you want to ask God, God, would you take me outside of my limited space and let me see your infinite beauty? Let me see the fullness of who you are. Let me try to explain it practically. If, excuse me. If you have a water, water has kind of three expressions. Okay, water is the, the, the liquid that you see. Water is frozen and it becomes ice. Water is heated and it becomes steam. So though it is water that flows, though it is ice that is frozen, though it is steam uh, that's expressed, you would say, hey, it's water expressed in three different ways. A lot of times people use the uh, egg illustration. So you've got the shell, you've got the white runny stuff, and you got the yolk, right? But you call it an egg, though it has three different parts to it. So God himself is one housed in three expressions. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to be able to land a couple of key parts today. Uh, But I want to just run through a few things in the scripture that it says the Holy Spirit is and does. The Holy Spirit, this is why you need him. The Holy Spirit is the one who draws us, corrects us, convicts us teaches us, seals us, sanctifies us, unifies us, bonds us, administrates us. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads us, gifts us, fills us with peace, joy, and righteousness, who helps us, empowers us for witness, uh, and the life that he does, he works through us. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can miss him. We can resist him. Uh, 
He is described in different ways. He's described as a dove. He's described as oil. He's described as fire. He's described as wind. He's described as water. He is described as wine. Wow, that's a big God. And I left some stuff out. So we have the Holy Spirit is God. He expresses himself in all these unique ways. But Jesus specifically makes sure that we know that the Holy Spirit is who he has left so that we might know God intimately and walk with him uh, experientially. So um, John 16, verse 7, Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Everybody say advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now, I just need to clarify again with everybody. Jesus was speaking. He was present with his guys and the crowds around him who were listening in when he was describing what was about to come. And here's what he said. I am a time and space person. You guys are about to push through just to touch the hem of my garment that you might be healed. You guys are being touched by the words that are coming out of my mouth. You've experienced my friendship, my intimacy. Everything about this experience has been housed in me. (laughs) But I am sending the Holy Spirit because I'm going to ascend. I will be gone. And when I'm gone, I will always be with you because I'm sending him to live and reside inside of you. That is an absolute blow away. That right now, in this moment, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, and the Holy Spirit is where? Right here. He is present in this place. He is housed inside of his people. It's no longer a temple, though he visits places. In the end, we are the temple of the living God. It's gone from a person that we had to attach to in a a tangible, real way to the Spirit of God that is now present wherever we go. That is amazing. And here's here's the term used in the Greek where it says the helper, which is used throughout the New Testament to describe the Holy Spirit. The Greek word is the word paraclete, which means the one who walks beside, the one who comes alongside. So the Holy Spirit is literally the one who comes alongside the believer and walks with us wherever we go. And and actually, biblically, he uh, comes inside of us so that we walk with him. Wherever we go, he is with us if we are born again and we have trusted in Jesus. I love the the Amplified expands the definition. Every time this word helper, the Amplified Bible says this, he is the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, and the standby. Okay, just hold on. I know I'm just rocking and rolling here, but you need to to attach into this. Anybody need a helper today? Anybody need a comforter? Anybody need an advocate? Anybody need an intercessor? Anybody need a counselor? No, they wouldn't. I do. Well, come on. I need counsel. We'll just say counsel. Say, I don't need a counselor. You do. You need counsel from God. Anybody need a strengthener? Anybody need a standby? Well, you have it. Whoa. We have it. We're just not accessing it. We're not accessing the fullness of what God has for us as the person of the Holy Spirit, he is here. He is here. Uh, I shared a few months ago about a unique thing that happened uh, at the end of 2022. Excuse me, at the end of 2020. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, after some really challenging things going on, um, and I, did sh- I have shared this, that my sister-in-law was struggling with cancer and was kind of uh, they were just saying, all right, these are her last days, and whether your God does a miracle or she's going to be home, hospice was there. My brother and um, his sons and daughters were rotating, caring for her and standing with her. This is a beautiful woman of God, an incredible lady. Uh, her name is Wren, and um, just a servant of the Lord. And so it was precious, but it was terrible, right? It was painful, but it was beautiful. All those things were going on at the same time. And... Um, In the middle of that, I'm going through my own struggles, and this buddy of mine, uh, Michael, and I were praying together on Fridays. And so uh, he said, what's going on? And I said, well, let's just ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to do today. And so 
uh, we're praying, we're waiting on God, and I get this picture in my mind, so real, so tangible, unsolicited, uh, of me and the house that I was born in, in New Haven, Connecticut. And during that time, my mom was struggling with all kinds of depression. She was taking Valium. Uh, my brothers and sisters were all older, from 10 years older to 4 years older. And when I was a little boy, mom was a little overwhelmed by everything that she had to do to deal with me. And my brother and sister would, it would tell me later on in life, they said, you would just scream all day. They had you kind of in this high bar playpen so you couldn't get out. Mom would take Valium, crash on the couch, and we'd go out and play just to get away from you. That was, uh, that was their encouragement. And so... Uh, so I'm taken back into that scene into my mind as we're saying, Holy Spirit, what do I need to know today? And as I'm taken back, I see in my mind's eye uh, Jesus sitting next to my mom, holding her hand. Isn't that beautiful? An unbeliever, actually antagonistic to God. So in this vision, in this picture, I believe illuminated by the Holy Spirit, I see Jesus just holding my mom's hand, so wanting to comfort her. Can I just say, wherever you are, if you're listening right there, Jesus just wants to hold your hand and comfort you. Even if you're far from God, that's why he came. He came that he might extend his hand to us and care for us. So he's, he's sitting there, and, you know, and, and there I am just screaming like crazy. And then in my mind's eye, I see Jesus walk out of the house, walk over to my brothers and sisters, tap my oldest brother on the shoulder, and he walks in, takes me out of the crib, and picks me up. Now, just hang with me. I know this is a little out there. But what if you've heard me tell my story, you guys might know, my brother was really my surrogate father. He, he was the one that cared for me, nurtured me. None of us were believers. But I always wondered, how, why did he like me, you know? Uh, why did he care for me? Why did he let me, uh, why did he teach me how to play sports? Why did he let me go on dates with he and his girlfriends? What was it? Why was he drawn to me? And in this moment, I realized, yes, he had a heart uh, for his little brother, but it was Jesus that cared for me even before I knew him. And I'm explaining this picture to my friend Michael, and he does not know any of my brothers and sisters, doesn't know any of their names, doesn't know anything that's going on. And he, be, and, and, and he said, I got, God's wanting to speak right now. And he said, Lord, would you bless Brother John right now? For the way that he served Jimmy in his time of need, would you bless John the Beloved? Would you bless Brother John right now by the Holy Spirit? That's my brother's name, and my buddy didn't know it. And he said, would you bless John right now? And whatever pain or struggle he's going on, God, would you return for him the way that he comforted his brother? Would you comfort him now by the Holy Spirit? He is sitting by his wife's bedside at the time that this experience is going on. We finish praying, I call him, and I tell him that experience. You hear crying on the phone, and the nurture of God, I have his wife on the phone and, and, and as well with them, and I'm just telling them, and, and God spoke to me so clearly because his wife had been so sacrificial to love the family, to love Jesus, to honor God with her life, and, and I felt like the Lord said, and Ren, receive the reward of your sufferings, and family, receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Whoa! That's why I believe in the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter. He knows all things. He knows the past. He knows the present. And he knows the future. But we got to let him in our house. We got to let him in our heart. We got to let him in our minds. We got to. We got to. We got to let him be himself. And for him to be himself, we have to pause. We got to get a little quiet. Got to open our hearts and hands and say we believe. We believe, Holy Spirit, that you care to comfort. We believe, Holy Spirit, that you reach out to even people that are far from you. We believe, Holy Spirit, that you are all that you say you are. We need you. You see, the Holy Spirit is the voice. He's the presence of the Father. And he's the expression of Jesus on earth. John 16, 12 through 15, Jesus goes on to say this. This is Jesus speaking. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, speaking of the Holy Spirit. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me. This is Jesus speaking. He will glorify me, for he will take a mine, and he'll disclose it to you. All things that the Father has our mind, Jesus speaking. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine or ours 
and he will disclose it to you. What do you need from the Father? What do you need from Jesus? The Holy Spirit is speaking, leading, guiding, directing, and he is the now voice of God for whatever you need. You know, I shared a very dramatic picture of a place of pain in my own heart and a, a, a place of God comforting a, a crisis, a family in crisis, my own family. But what about just the mundane of life? The, you know, the scripture says you'll hear the voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Does everything matter to God? My answer is absolutely yes. That God wants to speak from the littlest thing to the largest thing. Had a fun thing happen yesterday morning. Uh, my buddy Scott Landerholm, uh, he's a professor at Baylor, and he also runs a, a handyman business. And so that handyman side has been really beneficial for us, uh, as we have hired him many times. And um, so we had a, an electrical problem, and the lights went out in a certain part of our house, and uh, we couldn't figure it out. And Scott came by and couldn't figure it out that day, and we thought we were going to have to call a major uh, electrician. And, um, and so Scott calls yesterday morning. I texted Laura yesterday morning. He said, hey, in the middle of the night, I was praying about it because I would like to solve problems. And he said, in the middle of the night, I, I had a thought about what the impediment is to the electricity and where the power box might be for this particular source and problem. And he said, I don't know if it's the Lord or not, but let's give it a shot. So 8 a.m., Scott shows up in the morning, and you know he's kind of apologizing. Maybe it's not the Lord. Maybe it is the Lord. I said, Scott, we are easy. Come on, man. What do we have to lose? There's nothing to lose. Let's go for it. He goes, he found the, the power box, which is the, the, the power source, basically, for you electricians. Don't worry about it. Just go with me. And uh, it wasn't where anybody thought it would be. And then he said, well, it doesn't have the, the wattage. And then he finds the impediment for it. And all of a sudden, everything works. And we were rejoicing, I mean, literally jumping up and down, hugging each other, high five. We said, yes, the Holy Spirit speaks to electricity in the name of Jesus. And the benefit to our household was this, time, money, <laughs> tension, maybe relational tension, who knows what could have happened with these lights out for long, but the Holy Spirit in a moment speaks to somebody that's asking about something practical to help a family in need. God speaks to you about what you need. Turn right, turn left, what your family needs, what, what you need to know in the workplace. We have a now God that wants to lead his people. And I not only want you to believe that, I, I want you to embrace that. He is a God who speaks now. Well, he is God. He is our comforter. He is our uh, leader in all things. And the Holy Spirit is the exalter of Jesus. I love this. Go back to our original passage, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. It says, therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. You can't curse Jesus and bless the Lord at the same time in the Holy Spirit. That's why people say, you know, are you being religious when you hit your thumb and you say, Lord Jesus? <laughs> I'd rather you say that than to curse, don't you think? It's all right. Just get used to saying Jesus as your filler of worship in between everything that you do, right? So nobody can curse God and bless God but by the Holy Spirit. And then it says this, and no one can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Now let me just take a moment and say this. It says, no one comes to the Father lest the Spirit draw them. It says, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God, born of the Spirit. And so there is this wooing and drawing to Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Jesus uh, uh, literally came and lived a perfect life. He modeled how to depend on God, how, how to depend on the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was uh, uh, nailed to the cross. He was crucified, dead and buried. He rose from the dead. He uh, ascended to the Father. He came uh, uh, after his uh, resurrection. He appeared for 40 days and then he ascended to the Father. Before he ascended, he said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit, just as we talked about, to be a wit for, to, to come on you in power, to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He ascends to the Father. They wait 10 days and the Spirit of God comes. So we now live in the present tense of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, but we live in it because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So when we talk about do you love Jesus, do you worship Jesus, it is not in conflict with the Holy Spirit. It is the delight of the Holy Spirit. 
It is the mission of the Holy Spirit to point us to Jesus, to point us back to the cross, to point us back in the perfect life of Jesus. It is that Jesus is the exact representation of God. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the personification of God. So we want to know who to be like in a person. We look at the life of Jesus. And there is not only any conflict, but every time we worship Jesus and exalt Jesus and we open our hands to Jesus, the Spirit of God is the the one fueling the grace to do it and the one who is excited and celebrating with us because his whole mission is to bring us to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? So when you say, I feel uncomfortable saying, come Holy Spirit, what about Jesus? Don't worry. Jesus is not offended. He said, I'm leaving the Holy Spirit. The Father, uh, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They're all blessing each other and they are all blessed when we worship in the name of God uh, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. L- let me try to put this in a, uh, another, another scripture and then an illustration. First John 5, 6. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood, and is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. He testifies of Jesus. I think James can come on out if he can hear me. Um, James is going to help me just a moment. And what we're going to do is we're just going to sing a simple little chorus about who Jesus is. I love in Revelations 5, it says that uh, in the throne room, they found none worthy to open the seals that reveal uh, the, the outworkings of eternity and salvation. And then they said, oh, there is one worthy, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He alone is worthy to break the seals, and, it, and, it, and it, it, it intimates throughout that passage that then the Spirit of God and the angels all begin to, to sing together, worthy is the Lord, worthy is the Lord, holy, worthy. So every time we sing holy and worthy, we enter back into that scene of the throne room and what we're made for, which is Jesus himself. So what do you got? What key are we going in, bro? I'm singing with him. Come on. He left me hanging. All right, come on.
Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing Jesus again to our hearts. We recognize your work in the exaltation of Jesus. It is right. It is sweet. It is clean. It is pure. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for drawing us to Jesus. Amen. Why did I do that, and why did I pull us out? You're like, hey, dude, just keep going, right? <laughs> what I'm trying to communicate again is when we sense that high worship, when our hearts are drawn, when all we want is Jesus, just, just know that not only does it put a smile on the heart of Jesus, but it literally puts a smile on the Holy, heart of the Holy Spirit. It puts a smile on God the Father because we're worshiping the one who the worship is intended for. So the Holy Spirit is God. He's the comforter. He's the caregiver. He's the leader in the mundane and in the needy. He is the one ex who exalts Jesus. And I love this one. He's the writer and revealer of Scripture. Whoa, come on now. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this. All Scripture is breathed out by God. And profitable for teaching, for proof, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. But I know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's interpretation. That's the, the, the canonized word of God. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This word is God breathed. It's living and active. The Holy Spirit wrote it on behalf of the Father and the Son, <laughs> expressing through men and women who had were submitted to the Holy Spirit of God. It is God-breathed. Therefore, it's a supernatural book. You can hand the Bible to people, and they can be transformed simply by reading it, no matter what their background is, because the Spirit of God is on it and in it. You can learn from the Word of God by simply praying. Lord, show me your word, open my eyes, teach me your way. And God will reveal himself by the Holy Spirit. The scripture says that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's clean, it's pure, it's restorative, it's life-changing, it's corrective. There's so many beautiful things, but it is supernaturally God breathed. There's a Greek word uh, when it says God breathed here in 1 Corinthians 3. It says uh, theonustosis, theonustos, um, means breathed by God. God himself, the same breath that put life in you is the same one that breathed life through the writers of scripture so that we might experience it by revelation and not just by rote. It is not just good principles to be good people. It's the power of God to transform lives. Had a dear uh, friend whose uh, husband passed away much earlier than she would have ever thought. She found herself widowed at a young age. And she was wondering, what do I do? God, I, don't, I, can't, I can't live without him. I can't live in the midst of this pain. It was a godly couple, a godly family. They had served the Lord together. And she had people pray for her. She went to counseling, and nothing was really working. And, and she said, God, what do I do? And he said, your healing is in my word. And she said, for four straight months, I read five to six hours a day and was washed with the water of the word until I was whole again. That's supernatural. That's the power of this book. Try Jesus first. Try the word of God <laughs> under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let him wash you. In a more dramatic way, the, the, word of, the, the power of the word of God, I have a dear friend named Bekele Shanko been used mightily of God. He's a vice president for Campus Crusade, or now called Crew. And uh, Bekele has an incredible story as a young boy at five years old. He, he lived in a village in Ethiopia. His dad was a witch doctor and um, uh, moved in unusual power from the demonic side. Well, they were visited by the Lord. A couple of angels showed up in their village. And uh, I have this story on a podcast that uh, you can go to the Pastor Purpose podcast. I think it's coming out this week. 
Uh, but they were visited by these angels, a very dramatic thing. Uh, and they were an illiterate family in an illiterate village. Their people group was about a million people. Nobody knew Jesus. They were animists by background. And in this uh, scenario, um, these angels correct and challenge him. You're going to the dark side. There is a light, and he has a name, and his name is Jesus, and you come to Jesus and renounce darkness, and they leave. Well, in the midst of the journey, this Man responds the best way he knows how, but he says, God, how do I know you? And he's walking in his, what would be the equivalent of a backyard, and underneath the tree, there's a book. And his father picks up the book, and he opens the book, it's the Bible, and he can read it. He's an illiterate man, he can't read. Well, of course, as you can imagine, the power of the Word of God being read aloud in this illiterate village, the power of the Spirit of the Lord on this newfound faith, now the power of God to replace the power of darkness would rock and shake this whole village. And ultimately, 95% of that people group of a million people ended up coming to the Lord because of a visitation of the Lord. But here's what Bikita would, would always say. If he had not found the book, we would not have found the Lord. It is always together. It is the Word of God and it is the Spirit of God in full unity called Spirit and Truth that allows us to holy rock walk with God. So as we are talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we are talking about experience. I shared a unique vision. We talk about dreams. We talk about all these supernatural things. And you're questioning, I wonder if this is real or not or whatever. If it does not align with the Word of God, then it is not God. But when it does align with the Word of God, we know that we're not only in a safe place, but we're in a right place. Because the Word of God is supernatural, and the Word of God testifies of the glory of God, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then affirms and confirms the acts of God by the grace of God. And sometimes people have asked, you know, uh, Antioch's a little out there, which uh, you haven't been out there if you think we're out there. But anyway... uh, (laughs) Antioch's really out there, you know, and some of these these gifts of the Spirit and all this stuff. How far is this thing going to go? And I I found it comforts people for me to say, we're not going any further than this book. And they say, oh, praise the Lord. And I kind of snicker as they walk away, and I said, I don't think they've read the book. (laughs) It's wild. There's stuff going on there that we have not even touched yet, by the way. And Jesus said, even greater works will we do in the name of the Lord. But it'll be under submission to the lordship of Jesus. It'll be under submission in full agreement with the word of God. Because the writer of the word of God is the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, The Holy Spirit has his own book. It's called Acts. (laughs) The hero of the story in the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit. Obviously, he, he is the one who breathed this throughout the scriptures. So when you need just personal comfort right now, like this morning, I felt led to Psalm 23. And uh, I'm working through some sleep stuff, and God's been so faithful to help me with sleep issues. And I had a little concern about something last night, and a little fear came in. And I went to Psalm 23, though I walked through the valley of shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. And I needed that word again. And I just sat there in Psalm 23 and was washed and renewed. How about you? What do you need? It's in here by the Holy Spirit. And he'll guide and direct you if you'll let him wash over you. Well, hey, let's, let's wrap it up here. Um, as we go on this journey around the person and work of the Holy Spirit, we will continue to affirm he is God. We will continue to affirm all those aspects of the long run-on sentence. We'll continue to affirm he's the paraclete, the one who walks beside. We got nine weeks to unpack all the nuances and the uniquenesses of the beauty of the demonstration of the grace of God through the Holy Spirit. It's going to be awesome. And But as I woke up on Monday morning praying about this Sunday's message in the upcoming nine weeks, I felt God speak this simple phrase to me. This is for the hungry and the humble, not for the distant and resistant. This is for the hungry and the humble, not for the distant and resistant. And I believe with all my heart, God has given us a will by the Holy Spirit, and we can choose which one we are. If you say, I'm not hungry, then join us in the fast. Set something aside that's filling the need of your heart and make room for God. If you say, I'm not humble, then by faith you can humble yourself to the word of God. Read James 4, 1 through 8. It'll help you get humble. 
It says that if we submit ourselves to God, we will receive grace. For the humble receive grace. Man, I need grace. I want to humble myself to God and to his word. Hungry and humble. But, you know, being a preacher, I thought, Lord, that's a great word. Hungry and humble, you know, distant and resistant. That's really cool. What about holy? I think I'll just add holy. It's for the hungry and the humble and the holy. And then the Holy Spirit said, don't you dare say that. It's not for the holy. It's for the hungry and the humble. And I make them holy. Because if you feel that you have to be holy before you come to God, you'll never get there. And you'll never be enough. But if you are hungry, God, I need you in my unholiness. I need you in my addiction. I need you in my brokenness. I need you in my distance. I need you. I am hungry for you, and I humble myself to you. And by faith, I'm saying, Lord, I'm in. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please God. For you who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. My friends, you're being invited in in a fresh way, whether you're an old believer or a new believer or an unbeliever, if you are hungry and know your need, the Holy Spirit is meeting you at this altar today. The altar could be where you're sitting in your stand or whether you come down here in a moment, but God wants to meet with you if you're hungry and you're humble. Don't let life deal you so many blows that you have to become hungry and humble. Why don't you choose by faith? We're going on a unique ride, you guys. God's leading us. The Holy Spirit's leading us, and it's for all of us, if we want him, if we want him.